Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ana Patricia Rodriguez, and I am an associate professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese School of Languages, Literatures and Cultures at the University of Maryland College Park. And we would like to welcome you to our uh, keynote event um, associated or more like uh, for the Connected Diaspora's Central American Visuality in the Age of Social Media exhibition that um, we currently have at um, the Stamp Gallery at the University of Maryland. It is running from um, actually Monday, September the 21st through October the 17th. And we hope for those of you who are on campus, you might have an opportunity to visit. Um, we will have visual, um, a visual tour soon up at the website of the Stamp Gallery. And, um, and we hope that um, you will be able to see a lot of the images and, um, and the layout and the gallery. But um, this is the first event. Um, well, the first event actually was Tuesday. That was our opening Instagram with um, the curator. And today is our keynote. So um, before I you know, introduce our keynote um, and say a little bit about um, the exhibition, I would like to acknowledge that um, we are in the Mid-Atlantic in the state of Maryland in Prince George's County, and that we are on stolen land of the original peoples. Our speaker today, Mauricio E. Ramirez is uh, on the West Coast in San Francisco, California, and he is also um, in, on stolen lands. And um, so I will identify and I will read our land acknowledgement. Um, before that, um, we would also like to recognize um, the memory of Brianna Taylor and all those who have lost their lives in their struggle for justice. And so, you know, we would um, really like to dedicate this keynote um, um, talk to the memory of people who struggle every day um, to be heard and to be um, seen in this society and also for um, their rights that, you know, we recognize that um, we must all join in that struggle. Um, the land acknowledgement that, you know, we, we have here at University of Maryland says, every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contributed their hope, dreams, and energy into making the, the history that has led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migrate from their homes in the hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations that, than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. In the Division of Student Affairs, uh, where the stamp gallery is housed. We believe it is important to create dialogue to honor all those that have been historically and systematically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is so often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. Our brother uh, Mauricio E. Ramirez is in San Francisco, as I mentioned, and he is on Ohlone lands, also uh, stolen from the original peoples. Um, we are on, on indigenous lands that were stolen from these communities by European uh, colonists. We pay respects to the Piscataway and Ohlone elders and ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And with that said, um, we do dedicate this exhibition to um, our indigenous brothers and sisters and our black brothers and sisters and all who struggle immigrants as well in this land in these uh, times of COVID-19. And um, we wish you good health um, here from the state of Maryland and the University of, of Maryland as well. Um, I would like to now turn and say a little bit about the event that brings us together, the Connected Diaspora Central American Visuality in the Age of Social Media exhibition, which I mentioned is taking place at the Stamp Gallery. It is curated by the fabulous curator, Veronica Melendez. Um, she has gathered uh, a, a number of artistic um, pieces in different media 
uh, by young artists of the 1.5 and second generation diaspora, Central America here in the United States. You will have an opportunity to see some of the pieces in our keynotes um, presentation. And um, it is a very, very um, exciting exhibition uh, for us here in the Mid-Atlantic where as many of you know, um, one of the largest Central American Salvadoran communities resides. For me personally, it's been um, something long in the making that, and that I've dreamed of having at the University of Maryland. And so I'm really happy that, you know, finally it materialized, although under these conditions of COVID, um, it, it may be hard to see, but we will, you know, um, hopefully have uh, video footage soon. So um, it is an exhibition that brings together the art pieces of um, generations of uh, young Central Americans, some born or raised in the United States. Um, some are, are maybe generations in of having been raised in the United States, but alike, you know, they're um, connected by um, the dispersion that happened as of the Civil War, if not before, that brought many Central Americans to, to the United States. And it's been a diaspora long in the making. It's not a recent diaspora. It has its um, different um, peoples dispersed throughout the country in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Washington, DC, in New York, in Houston, and so forth. So what this exhibition does marvelously is bring together artists that represent this diaspora through visual representation and um, it is not a very a homogeneous exhibition. There are very um, um, exciting pieces that represent different aspects of identity construction, about heritage, about history, about um, uh, trauma, the trauma, the intergenerational trauma that we carry. A lot of themes run across the exhibition. And our keynote speaker today is going to kind of um, do an overview of, of the exhibition, but as well as um, the artistic production that happens throughout the country by um, US Central Americans. So I am not gonna take up more space, but I do want to introduce our speaker today, who is um, Mauricio E. Ramirez. And um, he is an artist, curator, and PhD candidate in Latin American and Latino studies at UC Santa Cruz. He is completing a, an emphasis in um, visual studies. Now, Mauricio Ramirez was born and raised in San Francisco. He is an expert on Latinx public murals and visual art of the San Francisco Bay Area. Mauricio's dissertation is titled Painting Central America, US Central American Visual Art of San Francisco. His dissertation explores the visual expressions and solidarity that emerged in San Francisco's Mission District as a response to the civil war in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua at the beginning of the 1980s. His research shed light, sheds light on the history of Central American art and activism, um, the emerging 1.5 and second generation US Central American artists, and the intersections of Latinx solidarity with Central Americans. Mauricio is currently a University of California President's uh, Pre-Professoriate Fellow and a SOMARTS Cultural Center Curatorial Resident. Uh, he is curating um, the upcoming exhibition Caravana, Mobilizing Central American Art 1984 to the Present along with Fatima Ramirez and Josue Rojas in San Francisco. And that exhibition is going to open in March of 2021. And coincidentally, um, Veronica Melendez, our curator, will have a few pieces in that exhibition as well as some other artists. So it's very interesting how we are very interconnected and um, the visualizations of the larger diaspora are being materialized in these exhibitions, Caravana and Connected Diaspora. So I am not going to take up more space here and I will um, cede my space to um, Mauricio Ramirez so that he can lead us through um, a discussion of, of um, his work as well as the art of the diaspora. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, uh, Ana Patricia Rodriguez. I am honored to be here with you today as a keynote speaker for the exhibition Connected Diasporas, 
U.S. Central American Visuality in the Age of Social Media, curated by Veronica Melendez. I want to give thanks to Dr. Ana Patricia Rodriguez, Dr. Kenzi Cornejo, and Veronica Melendez for inviting me to present this keynote address. I also want to thank Tara Youngborg, Brianna Yasmin Nunez, and all of the staff at Stamp Gallery at the University of Maryland for making this exhibition possible. I'm speaking to you as a child of parents who immigrated from El Salvador in the early 1980s. I was born and raised in the city of San Francisco amongst diverse racial and ethnic cultures in the largely working class neighborhood of the Outer Mission and Excelsior. I was fortunate enough to have found friends and to have friends from different backgrounds other than my own and attended schools that were just as diverse as the city. I grew up with notions of being an artist when I was in high school enamored by the murals of San Francisco's Mission District, and I also participated as a youth in Presida I's Urban Youth Arts Program, a nonprofit community-based mural arts organization dedicated to enriching and beautifying urban environments while educating the public on the history of community mural art. It was through the participation of this program, working on several large-scale and small-scale murals, that I began to understand the power of visual art and how it informs our everyday life. I entered college at UC Santa Cruz. I wanted to know the history of San Francisco murals and I also, and also my own personal history and the history of my parents. I studied art and um, more specifically painting um, or studio painting. But as, central, as a Central American artist, I knew that the walls of the Mission District spoke not just to Latinx culture, but also Central American culture. At that time, very few texts were written about Central American artists. I could only find a handful of books that mentioned Central American artists of San Francisco. And as I researched more and more, it became apparent that there was a huge gap in literature and documentation for Central American artists. But I knew that they were out there. And I knew the city of San Francisco itself had many Central American artists. So I, so I also speak to you as a historian and believe it is vital for Central Americans to document their experiences here in the US. I want to begin by saying thank you to the participating artists for their creativity, especially during this time when the world might seem grim, hopeless, and full of despair. Art has a way of uplifting us from darkness to inspire new generative ideas and creative ideas and can be a place for healing. It can also allow us to step away from reality and take us into a place of imagination. And dare I even say a place of liberation. like this lovely painting created by Jesse DeSantis, which is part of the exhibition and part of her series, Human Connection Via Nature. This painting honors her grandmother who migrated to New York from Managua after Nicaragua Civil War. Her grandmother was the head of her household and held her family together in order for them to have a better life. The national bird of Nicaragua is a guarda barranco, which sits on her grandmother's shoulder as they both look up to a hummingbird, a bird which represent, represents the Americas, right? It's a bird that is found throughout the Americas. To quote Jesse DeSantis, birds like human beings are, are migratory. They also embody a spirit that although not visible connects us all. The painting reminds me of the sacrifices of the first generation of Central Americans had to endure in order to enter the United States or any other country for which they arrived, be it Switzerland, Australia, Canada, or any other country for which the Central American diaspora is present. Those sacrifices are symbolic to the Central American community and ones we cannot forget. So let's begin with the story of how we got here. Why is it and how is it that Central American visual art in the age of social media is relevant? and important, not just for the art world, but also for diasporic Central American representation. As Central Americans, be it born here in the US, in our home countries, or the children of parents who immigrated from Central America, many of us have had the experience of encountering negative images of Central Americans fed to us by mainstream media, news, and Hollywood. We live in a country where Central Americans are vilified as criminal violent or visually portrayed as victims of war and harsh immigration enforcement policies. 
Historically, historically during the years of US intervention from roughly 1970s to 1990s, which fueled the Central American conflicts, the United States produced a visual discourse on Central Americans as victims of war, largely for US audiences. Those years of Central American civil wars produced a Central American subject and visual culture in what Dr. Kenzi Cornejo calls solidarity aesthetics. Cornejo states that solidarity aesthetics are images and representations of Central Americans that were made, selected, disseminated, and framed to produce empathy and encourage action with Central America across the world. However, it also established a reductive visual trope on Central America, one that is still used today. Despite intentionality, it set a pattern of ongoing visual objectification of Central Americans in media culture. And one challenged by US Central American artists today with the creation of critical art and images, which I believe is one of the aims of this exhibition. Post 1990s and up, and up to the present day, images of tattooed gang members have been frequently associated with Central, American, with Central America beginning with El Salvador, but then as the gangs went international, the image of Central American Maras were sensationalized across the world. This wave of hyper-generalized misinformation has resulted in misunderstandings of Central Americans and the wrongful criminalization of its people and creating a stigma around Central Americans. If you had never met a Central American, you might believe all Central Americans are tattooed gang members. More recently, images of Central American families and children locked up in detention centers across the United States permeate mainstream news and social media outlets, once again sensationalizing and making these events a spectacle, which lure in the masses. In June of 2018, the striking image of Yanela Sanchez, a two-year-old Honduran, Honduran asylum seeker, crying as her mother is searched and detained near the U.S.-Mexico border in McAllen, Texas, became a spectacle, and it also became an icon as to what is wrong with U.S. immigration policy. I share this image because it exemplifies how images of Central Americans are often manipulated and go viral. Images of, of suffering Central American migrants has become increasingly pervasive in the digital area. Where pain is commodified, images are often stripped of their emotional impact, and it has become a form of consumption, which since we are in the digital age and digital media, um, we are all kind of hyper-connected for those who choose to participate. We also have to reckon with the fact that images of Central Americans are also subjected to this treatment. Yet who are the authors and to what extent do they have the interest of Central American issues at heart? Or is it simply a political maneuver to get more views such as the timepiece that appeared July 2nd, 2018? Other images which are too horrific to show you have also widely circulated, such as Salvadoran Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez and his two-year-old daughter Valeria who drowned crossing the Rio Grande at the US-Mexico border. What these images do make apparent is again demonstrating what is wrong with US immigration policy. To quote Salvadoran American writer and journalist Roberto Lovato in his new memoir, Unforgetting, a memoir of family mig migration, gangs and revolution in the Americas. To quote, the mass imprisonment of Central American children fleeing violence has helped turn the United States into the world's leading jailer of children. I also point to this tweet by Professor Lacey Abrego, again, to demonstrate the power of social media and, connect and connectivity. A power at the, uh, sorry, a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, in the Department of Chicano and Central American Studies, whose research I look up to, uses Twitter to communicate her perspective as an academic, a mother, an activist, and a scholar, using the hashtag, hashtag Central or Central American Studies, hashtag CentAm Studies, or hashtag Central American Twitter. This digital space provides us for di provides connection for diasporic Central Americans. I use this image also when I teach undergraduate courses. And I asked my undergraduate students the same exact question. When was the last time they saw a Central American represented in film or TV as a full human being? Most don't agree or most have no idea, right? Um, and I'm always shocked at the responses. Many films throughout the 80s, 90s, um, even to the present day, usually marks Central Americans as victims or housekeepers or house cleaners. 
but never as professionals, right? It's very rare to see Central Americans presented as doctors, lawyers. So that makes me think, well, what what is media, Hollywood, and all these other kind of outlets telling Central Americans, especially Central Americans like myself, right, being raised here in the United States, about the potential U.S. Central Americans have? Having said all of this sort of negative outpour of how Central Americans are displayed here in the United States and across the world, it begs the question, how do Central Americans represent themselves in the United States? And how have Central Americans self-represented their own ideas, of politics, and identity through visual art? To think of U.S. Central American art is also to think about how art challenges assumptions put onto U.S. Central Americans. No art exhibition can encapsulate the extent of all Central American artists, nor can it tell a complete story. This exhibition connecting diasporas counters and takes an oppositional representative approach to the slew of images that is bombarding mainstream media and news outlets. The story of this exhibition has a lot to do with social media and the creation of La Orchata magazine, which you can see in front of you. A zine created by Veronica Melendez along with Kim Kimberly Benavides in 2017. La Orchata magazine is a seasonal publication which welcomes visual art and poetry of people of Nicaraguan, Honduran, Guatemalan, Panamanian, Costa Rican, Belizean, and Salvadoran ancestry to display their artwork. These are seven countries that make up Central America and its diaspora. In my conversations with Ver Veronica, she states she created La Orchata zine because she was frustrated and tired of not seeing enough representation for Central Americans in the art world, specifically the printed arts world. The first scene was pulled from Kimberly and Veronica's close friends in Washington, D.C. area. And by the time the second zine came about, there was an open call for entries, which circulated around social media, particularly Instagram, which is where I first saw it. There are over 100 submissions from across the country. It became apparent to Veronica and Kimberly that this scene was a space needed, a much needed space for U.S. Central American artists. And it was the power of social media that opened up La Orchata zine to connect people from all over the country, not as opposed to just the, the immediate Washington, D.C. area, which, as Professor Ana Patricia Rodriguez stated, um, if you're unfamiliar with the Washington, D.C. area, it hosts a very large and significant populations of Central Americans right here in our nation's capital. Orchata. Orchata is a drink, a traditional, a traditional drink um, to several Latin American countries and has different variations. You might have seen it in Mexican restaurants. They're pretty popular in Mexican restaurants, but they also exist in Salvadoran, um, Nicaraguan, Ecuadorian, and other um, restaurants. So there's different types of variation of horchata. Um, an horchata made from morro, a morro seed, also known as jicaro seed in Nicaragua, is used in El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. So in this sense, horchata connects the Central American diaspora, but also the clever way in which horchata zine covers speak to US Central American visuality. If you look here, I'm particularly fascinated by this cover that shows an horchata bag at the very center. And in the center of the frame, um, it's surrounded by seven flowers. These are the national flowers of Central America, of each Central American country that I previously mentioned. And at the very center, you see horchata, or what looks like liquid in a bag, right? And um, there's a straw at the very top. This is common in some Central American countries to have, you know, soda or liquids in a bag. And it kind of points to resourcefulness, right? Um, but another thing that I find very interesting about this image is maybe not intentional um, or intentional or not, but how I read it was that at the very center, there's also a, what looks to me like a, a volcano, a very kind of graphic way of, of, of kind of drawing a volcano. And it almost looked like the volcano is exploding. This exhibition honors the new visions and visual art by 16 US Central American artists and questions what it means to be Central American in the US. These visual representations are created by the 1.5 generation and second generation Central Americans in the US, and many of whom are self-taught artists. For those of you who might not be familiar with them, 
or with the term 1.5 generation, it refers to individuals who migrate to a new country before or during their early teens. They earn the label 1.5 generation because they bring with them or maintain characteristics from their home country, while also engaging in assimilation and socialization with their new country. The term 1.5 generation is one way to understand this in-betweenness that many Central Americans might have felt in migrating to the United States or elsewhere. But be it first gen, 1.5 generation, second generation, third generation Central American, the feeling of not being quite Central American and not quite being US American is very common. For example, Kiera Machado, a LA based artist whose mom is from Guatemala and father is from El Salvador, creates large and small scale oil paintings on her perspective and identity growing up in Southern California. The worry dolls are prominent figures in Quiera Machado's work. The worry doll might seem familiar for those who might have grown up in Guatemala or have seen them in their households or have seen them sold in mercados. These mostly handmade dolls originate in the highlands of Guatemala and are found in Mexico. According to the traditions of Mayans from Guatemala, when children, when children are, are scared or have nightmares, they give them worry dolls before they go to sleep. Then they put them under the pillow and when they wake up, their worries are gone. According to this legend, the exact origin, which is unknown, the doll worries about the problem instead of the person, allowing the person to sleep peacefully. So when the person wakes up, the doll will have relieved all the concerns that would normally keep them awake at night. Quiera Machado inserts the worry dolls often as obscured and camouflaged in her paintings and has become a signature in her paintings. If you see here, there's several worry dolls and I believe there's one at the very center as well. In a sense, the worry dolls also talk about Central American visibility and invisibility and often how Central Americans are here but not given the platform to speak or to be present. In an interview with bilingual Spanish newspaper El Tecolote, discussing her Diaria Entrado Uno exhibition at Acción Latina's Juan Fuentes Gallery in San Francisco in January of this year, Machado expressed that despite the flourishing Latinx art scene in LA, living and creating under the hegemony of Mexican culture has proven to be difficult for Machado who, fe for Machado who feels that her work is constantly misconstrued to be Mexican or Chicano or Chicanex. Machado states, I feel a little helpless sometimes. I get incredibly frustrated having to make the constant effort of reiterating the purpose behind my work and representing Central American identity. There are always art shows with all Latinx contributors, but art ends up being solely Mexican. So that makes me question how diverse these spaces really are. It's hard, but I think we're slowly making changes. Quiera Machado's experience is just one example of what it means to be cent a Central American artist in LA, which may be very different, or it can maybe be similar to those working in New York, Baltimore, Miami, Washington, DC, Houston, just to name some of the cities which these artists in the show are working from. What makes this exhibition unique is that Central American artists from across the country joined and each contribute their own unique perspectives. I hope you listen to the other artists' talks and conversations that are also programmed as part of this exhibition. We are at a point in time which new generations of Central American artists are representing their own histories visually, connecting the diaspora digitally and also physically. Slowly but surely, we are creating our own canons of US Central American art. This exhibition also reminds me to let us not forget about the past. To quote Roberto Lovato again, he urges us to counter the forgetting that we as Central Americans might carry inside of us. The forgetting of past traumas, of lived traumas, of family traumas, as remembering is simply the act of, of bringing something up. Unforgetting is a process that rescues and redeems the history. Central Americans are now the third largest Latinx population in the United States. And the US is also home to some of the largest Central American populations outside of Central America. So there's something to be said about US Central American art being in these institutional galleries and spaces, such as this iteration of Connected Diaspora being exhibited at Stamp Gallery at the University of Maryland 
and previously at Frederick Jamison Gallery at Duke University. Like I said previously, in the 1980s and 1990s, various artists in solidarity with Central America were creating, were creating solidarity artwork, but few Central American artists were not being exhibited and recognized in national and small galleries during that time. With the advent of social media, and especially during this pandemic, you might ask yourself, why is it necessary to have US Central American artwork exhibited in a gallery when we could just log on to our individual Instagrams or the Instagram, you know, profiles of the artist, because galleries and exhibition spaces bring people together. It allows for collaboration and builds communities. It puts artists who might have never known each other into contact with one another. It is the reason why I'm here with you today. Gallery and exhibition spaces also expand audiences exposure to other Central American artists. Also, not everyone is hooked onto social media. Certain people in certain generations do not participate in virtual spaces, and they still view art in physical spaces, which is really the beauty of this ex of the specific exhibition of how Veronica was able to track down Central American artists virtually and bring them and their artworks into a physical space. A proposition I pose for Central American creatives, curators, writers, is that there is a need for US Central American art to be documented. To quote Arlene Davila, a prominent thinker of US Central American, or sorry, a prominent thinker of US Latinx culture states, if I could reduce my decades long struggle of Latinx culture into one lesson, it is that visibil visibility is merely the first step to recognition, which in turn has very little to do with equity. So this exhibition is certainly one step in the right direction. However, it does not necessarily mean equity. In order for US Central American art to be documented and continue living, we need Central American artists to curate exhibitions in whatever venue available to you, be it in galleries, art fairs, nonprofit spaces, because this, open ups, this opens up opportunities for others. We also need writers to write about Central American artists. And if you're not Central American, but are in solidarity with Central America or support Central American and Latinx creatives, please support Central American and Latinx creatives by spreading the word, buying artwork and creating opportunities for artists to display their artwork. I will leave you with this quote by Adeline Davila in her new book, Latinx Art, Artists, Markets and Politics. One art dealer once told me that people should buy art because it speaks to them and because they love it not because of who makes it. I agreed with him, but added, people can't love what is never shown, what no one can name or ever see. This is why at the end of the day, gallery work is advocacy work. And so is writing, curating, collecting, and creating. I will end with this note, and I hope you enjoy the exhibition. For those of you who are able to physically view the show at Stamp Gallery at the University of Maryland, please do so. For those of you interested in learning more about the exhibition and the artists, these are, as you can see on the screen, these are future talks that Stamp Gallery will be hosting. You can also find them at the Stamp Gallery website. I hope you take the time to join these conversations and learn more about US Central American art. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Mauricio, for that very um, encompassing um, presentation on the art of the diaspora. And um, I wanted to remind people, we didn't say it at the beginning, but we, we invite you to um, send questions at the chat. Um, they will be um, collected by gallery docent um, Marjorie Antonio, and um, she's going to be forwarding it, them to us here and Mauricio. Um, we'll be able to address, you know, some of those questions. So please, you know, send them along. Um, we would like to, you know, be able to engage with you. I'm sure that, you know, there are a lot of um, questions or comments that, you know, you're interested in posing to um, Mauricio. So um, start sending them along. I also wanted to remind people that um, please, you know, um, if you can, uh, tweet, use your uh, social media to talk about Connected Diaspora. Um, we uh, have the handle um, hashtag central, excuse me, hashtag uh, connected diaspora. And also please tweet to um, hashtag Central American Twitter where all the 
um, emerging scholars and all the um, young Central Americans and everybody interested in Central America um, are. And also please uh, tweet to the hashtag studies Central American Studies, but uh, hashtag C-E-N-T-A-M studies. Um, so uh, please, you know, send them along because we really would like to engage the audience. But um, we have uh, quite a few minutes, like half an hour for Q&A. And um, I don't know if any questions have come in, but I certainly had some. Um, if uh, Mauricio would like to maybe converse. I really enjoyed your talk. And I think um, you are one of those um, artists activists, artivists that are at the foreground of um, the new, you know, diasporic Central American art, along with Veronica Melendez. So it's, it's really gratifying and great to see um, a new generation um, representing and using, you know, different forms that are very relevant to this moment, especially, you know, in the context of social media. And I was wondering, Mauricio, if you might address I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area in another area. And I remember, um, I always grew up with those fabulous murals that you, know, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk. And I'm wondering if you, know, you might talk about how San Francisco and having grown up in the Bay Area um, influenced you and shaped you as an artist and your, especially your mural art. So that's, yeah, that's, I, I guess, uh, you know, just being around in San Francisco, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of cultures, a lot of um, different Latinx cultures that are kind of all, I wouldn't say all in the Mission District. I mean, we're spread out, but Mission District being kind of that historical place where a lot of uh, Latinx culture kind of con congregates uh, was always kind of special to me. Um, and so growing up, a lot of the storefronts, weren't just, I mean, there was, I don't think there was ever necessarily a majority of say Mexican American or Chicano um, or Central American, but those were probably the two, you know, largest Latinx groups. And so growing up in San Francisco and seeing that kind of all around me, not just through the murals, but through the storefronts, um, just in, in, in one way or another, when I was younger as well, I did want to participate as an artist. Like I, I always thought visual art was a really kind of cool thing to do. Urban art, I always was kind of also very interested in graffiti um, growing up. So that along with public murals, because I was surrounded by so many public murals growing up, um, it almost felt just, I wouldn't say natural, but it felt like it was something I wanted to participate in, right? Um, similar to graffiti in a sense, it's very public. You, you don't, you know, people see it um, people feel it in a way um, that's very visual. You don't really have to speak, right? Um, but it's felt, and, and, and in the mission, it's, it's very dense, right? There's a lot of murals uh, for those who've been to, to the mission district. And, um, and so that, and, and also the, the opportunity Presida Eyes gave, you know, youth that were interested in participating in murals was life-changing. I mean, to the point where obviously I continue to want to know more of the history uh, because once you produce, and I produced murals there, but, you know, they were all kind of youth-led, um, so they weren't the most fantastic murals or, or, or you know, you know, as I, as I grew older, I kind of set aside painting. Um, I still am an artist, but I don't produce, you know, murals or, or paintings like I used to do. Um, but the environment in which I grew up in, right, was kind of, I'm definitely a product of that, right? I think, um, and also in seeing that there was very few documentation about this, I mean, that's what kind of led me to, to really know more of the history. And to this point, you know, find out that there's a bunch of other artists out there, even through this show, um, is exciting to see how much Central American art has, has produced. And, and this has been like maybe 10 years ago when I started kind of more, you know, academic and trying to learn more about what the history of Central American art is. Um, I'm fascinated to see so much production um, just written and, and visually, right, of, of diasporic Central Americans. Thank you. Um, it takes me back to the, the mission streets, right? And my pil pilgrimage is whenever I go visit family, which I haven't because of COVID, but, you know, I always make my 
pilgrimage to the mission and to go see uh, Balmy Alley and visit the murals. Um, I wanted to ask you too, like, you know, art is intergenerational, right? And so um, if you might comment, I know you've done interviews with, you know, artists of the mission, right? And uh, during the solidarity movement, the 1980s, you know, there were, art was very important, right? Um, poetry, um, paintings, I'm thinking of the work of Marta Yvonne Galindo, who has come to the university and actually spoken about her own pieces. Now she's not a muralist, but you know, she, she works on uh, um, printmaking and so forth, right? And so there was a whole group of, you know, activists, uh, um, you know, like uh, a lot of them involved in the movement in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and so forth. And again, I know that you've interviewed some of them for your project. And I'm wondering if you might uh, talk about that intergenerational aspect, right? And how, you know, th that energy also gets translated in the work of new artists. And, um, and so, one aspect is that the Central Americans that you know you might be connecting with, but also uh, Chicano, you know, artists. I think that Juan Alicia is is also somebody you you have worked with, right? Yes. Right, and uh, fabulous, you know, Chicana feminist a muralist. And in my mind, I have imprinted that image of um, that mural that used to be, I think, around uh, I want to say. 16th, 18th Street, Asalto, ceasefire of the boy, right, that is confronting the arms. Now, I was really saddened because I was actually there when, you know, the, it was being um, erased, right, um, grade, mm -hmm. okay? And so, you know, uh, for a lot of us, it was the, the passing of, you know, the, the art of, of the 80s, right? The people that painted them earlier on. So if you might speak about the intergenerational aspect with Central American artists, but also with Chicana, Chicano artists. So that's a, a really good point. And I think that's what also kind of inspires maybe the, the new generations, right? Especially if you're in San Francisco, is seeing that there is an older generation, a generation, you know, before that from even the 1970s, right? Uh, some of these murals were being created in the Mission District. Um, early 19 or late 1960s as well. But we start to see these murals and slowly they, they kind of add up, right? You start seeing, you know, several murals in the Mission District. And that's a visual signifier, right? I think growing up amongst that, um, it's really hard to not want to participate or, or be an artist or, or a young person who, you know, might be interested just a little bit into art and seeing this all around you. And then also maybe knowing the history of those artists. And that's where I think it's important because like you said, there was a, a kind of an older generation still active in painting and still active um, like Victor Cartagena, um, Carlos Cartagena, you know, uh, the Cartagena brothers and, you know, Martimón Galindo, um, Herbert Siguenza is another person I think of who were creating artwork in, in maybe the early 80s and and still to this day have not maybe gotten a whole lot of recognition. I think there is some some things that are written about them but slowly and surely we're getting written about, right? And I think that's also important, um, maybe not just for researchers, but for the general public to know that, you know, Central American presence has always kind of been there. Um, although, you know, a lot has been written about Chicano art and, and kind of Mexican culture um, connected to San Francisco and to the Mission District, because it's also a very historic site for the Chicano civil rights movement. Like, you know, you can't, you know, El Tecolote, I'm, I'm thinking about all these, you know, uh, nonprofits that were created and these Latinx institutions that were created in the 1980s uh, or 1970s, late 1960s as well, um, very much aligned with the other civil rights movements, right? Um, uh, Black liberation movements, third world movements. So there's this really rich history that San Francisco has, and it's it's had it for you know decades. And so for young people, I think that live in San Francisco or grew up. Um, are able to see that. And I would hope, you know, also encapsulate that to a certain extent. And so those generational kind of leaps um, are important. And I think it continues to construct a very kind of unique um, Central American art from San Francisco. And I know that's very different probably in other cities, right? I think because there is a rich, um, it's not only that, but there's also solidarity. So solidarity is a very important aspect here where, you know, artists might, 
might have or might have not felt welcome to be in a space that was during, you know, I would say 70s, um, very much Chicano or Mexican American kind of dominated, right? We had Galeria de la Raza, you know, there's other institutions that were very much created um, in line with the Chicano movement. But again, the aspect of solidarity, you know, I'm not speaking for, you know, all the, you know, Chicanos or, Central, or, or Mexicans that were in this movement, but I think there was an appreciation towards Central Americans, especially 1980s, and when, when we see huge waves of Central Americans coming into San Francisco, although those weren't, you know, the first waves, they're certainly the more massive waves, right? And so this idea of solidarity and building community within Latinx kind of culture, visually, um, that's also what fascinates me. And I think there's a lot of, you know, rich work uh, um, visually that's, that's, that had been created during that time. And I hope to, you know, that's kind of the, the, the hope of the exhibition that we're creating along with Josue Rojas and Fatima Ramirez is to hopefully kind of show some of those posters. I mean, a, a very small kind of visual um, representation there, but um, that is also part of our goal. Thank you for that. Um, I'm checking in to see if there are any questions from the audience, from our viewers, if um, Marjorie might have any. Maybe not. You know, I'm seeing some in the chat. Oh. But in the uh, YouTube live version of this. Oh, yeah. Well, um, um, go ahead. If, uh, if you see something you want to respond to, I see Marjorie um, in, in the Zoom, if she has any. Not yet. Hello. Hi. Hi, Marjorie. Nice to see all of you. This was, has been a wonderful talk so far. Um, there are a lot of questions um, in the chat. Um, would you guys like to get started? Yes. Um, from Margo, uh, he said they said that uh, such a good, such a cool exhibit. What made you gravitate towards murals and other traditional forms of visual art? Yeah, so I might have, I might have answered that already, but it was certainly growing up in San Francisco. I can't, you know. Um, I can't kind of get away from the fact that, you know, having been grown in the city that had so much art was key to, to me just being interested in this. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine being, you know, growing up somewhere else. Um, it was really, you know, the, you know, and I guess to a certain extent, I, mean, I knew that my, my, so my family, my grandmother also had a, a background in sewing, she, she, in, in the arts. And so, I mean, as I got older, I knew that, but it kind of made sense where it's like, oh, you know, there's somebody else in the family that also participated in creating art. And so I think that's kind of like the creative uh, kind of juices um, come from, is definitely from my family. It was so lovely to hear about like um, passing down um, the art in the family as well. Um, so here's another question um, from Alex. Um, they ask, um, what is the role of collectivity and solidarity within the work of Central American artists and cultural producers? And is this distinct in your estimation? That's a good question. I think it really depends um, because solidarity, the way I was speaking about it earlier was kind of a, a, a certain time. Um, the 80s are coming out from the third world, you know, um, liberation movements, and then Central American, you know, civil wars, there's a lot of solidarity around that. And but I also want to kind of bring it back to the now, right? I think Central American artists are creating a lot of solidarity artwork um, with what's happening at the border. And I think there's a lot there for Central Americans to unpack, especially those who are here, right, um, might feel the need to actually write, speak up, paint, you know, even write about what's happening at the border with our other fellow Central Americans. Um, you know, this this idea of our um, hermano lejano or, you know, hermana lejano. I mean, th th there's this concept that's been used also in, in literature, um, which I think is very generative because in thinking about that we are also in the sense kind of diasporic, right? We're, we're our ancestors, and we might have family members that are in Central America, and and people crossing the border. We might know people who have TPS, you know, TPS, um, and for all of that to kind of 
I wouldn't say go away, but for it to be very diff, it's very difficult to be, I think, a Central American. And, and in terms of creating art, I hope to see, and there is a lot of art being created in solidarity with what's happening and not just by Central Americans, but other, other, you know, identities, right. Other people that participate are seeing what's happening at the border and what's been happening right in the past decade as something very important. And I think solidarity is, is very generative in that sense is to create more artwork and visibility to issues that are happening. Yeah, that was um really great um a response. Um I definitely will be keeping an eye out um for more responses. And very um similarly to the previous question and your response as well. Um from um Julian. Um they say, Hi Mauricio, could you discuss some artists to keep an eye out on for the upcoming years? That's a tough one. I don't I don't there's so many of us, right? There's so many, I mean, there's so many like Central American artists um, in even this show, which are 16 artists. Um, I would say look out for all of them. I mean, the, you know, everyone in this show, I think will, will hopefully continue creating artwork. Um, every city has their own artist, and this is kind of the power. I think this is maybe like the first step um, where digital spaces have definitely connected artists uh, and creatives and so I'm curious to just see more art being produced, more exhibitions hopefully being produced. And, you know, I would say keep out an eye for all of us because, you know, we're all, I think everyone's creating art and, and it's all very important. Even the few that are in this exhibition, many of them I didn't know previously. And just looking at their Instagram or their individual websites, I learned so much from those artists um, that, you know, a whole lot of, uh, articles could be written about them or documentaries right in, in the future so it's a really exciting time because we are the the sons and daughters usually of this first generation and there's a lot of us right so there's there's plenty and and, and we all might have shared experience you know very different i know it's very different depending on where you you were born and raised um but the art hopefully is going to speak and and i hope you know digitally physically right um, the art is going to be there. So I don't really want to like name a specific artist, but there's, there's many, right. And I have many artists, uh, that, that I like, but I'm not, you know, going to share like specifically which, which ones to look for, because I think we're all, you know, in a spirit of community, right. I think we're all going to, you know, create really fantastic work as time goes on. Yeah, totally. Um, and everybody in the exhibition, all of their work is fantastic. It was a wonderfully curated show. Um, and very similarly to the last question, this one's from Jorge. Um, they said, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, how are U.S. Central American artists making transnational inroads into their countries of origin, their heritage nations? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, that's a question that kind of stumps me because I don't really know, to be honest. Um, I guess, cause I focus so much on US Central American artwork being created here. I'm not so sure how those inroads are being built. Um, I would hope that they're being built, um, but I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Oh, um, that's totally okay as well. Um, and I think that's something um, to build off of as well um, as we, further discuss um, all these shows, all these works in conversation. Um, and from Jorge again, um, they have another question and they're asking, are US Central American artists um, being engaged in their heritage countries, the countries they diasporically relate to and identify with? Uh, that's another question too that let me, let me read it. Hold on. You know, I'm not too sure, again, if, if, because it seems like that's more of an individual question, right? Are Central American artists being engaged in their heritage countries? Um, potentially. And I think there, I guess there's something to be said there, I think. Um, there is this disconnect and, I, and I've seen it, I've read about it um, uh, in, Arlene Davila's book, and I think that's kind of important to, to bring up. I, I brought up quotes from Arlene Davila, but, you know, sometimes it seems like especially collectors, right, um, that are coming from Latin America are 
you know usually have very are very wealthy and they would rather collect from an artist that's from a specific country and when we're talking about u.s central american artists um it's hard to place that category are they american is it american art is it uh something unique like u.s central american art um you could say chicano art right chicanx art is very specific to a certain style right or, or maybe from a certain movement and so it brings that's a good question because i think it it brings into this other question that aline davila brings up um in saying well who's collecting what type of art and what type of art is being appreciated by collectors right um when you say american art or latinx u.s latinx art um it seems to be dismissed by some curators um or collectors who might be collecting from a certain country or for a certain country right um and so there is this kind of i don't know right i don't know if, if, if central american artists are being recognized in el salvador i do know a few actually that you know and this is where you know generation are they are they born in 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 central america and are doing art here but still being recognized back in their home countries or are they purely like second generation right maybe born of parents from central america and creating art here i don't know what that relationship is looking like i do know that some artists do uh, obviously exhibit back in their home countries um but i'm not so sure how much that is actually happening but that's that's a good question yeah thank you um i think that brings up a lot of important questions about how place and citizenship is very um, tenuous and at times it's also not very tangible um, when considering art because of movement and um, migration. Okay, um, so here's another question from Andy um, asking specifically about um, doctoral programs. Um, they say, um, great presentation and beautiful artwork. Um, what was your inspiration in pursuing a doctoral program that focuses on Central American art visuals? That's a good question because it's very challenging to actually, it's very time consuming and, and, and a very long, it's like a marathon to create or to, to complete a PhD program, right? Um, not everyone might have hopes to, to be a PhD or, or you know, so that's that's an excellent question. Um, I think it was really when I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz, I realized that there was a huge gap in the literature, um, be it art history or ethnic studies, you know, different disciplines. I just felt like not many people were writing about Central America or Central American artists, especially US Central American artists. There was a few here and there, but um, I almost made it at that point, like a mission to, to track down the history. And it was more because I wanted to know the history. And then I realized that, well, academia, right? Uh, the way it's constructed, there is a lot of, you know, I don't necessarily, there's there's certain hierarchical things and, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, critique with academia, especially right now, right? On the way it's governed, the way it works. Um, but I was always interested in hopefully one day becoming a professor or writing a book on U.S. Central American art, especially if, you know, specifically of San Francisco. That at that moment is when I realized I was like, wow, there's no books really on this art. And I think San Francisco is full of this rich history. So that's kind of the moment when which I wanted to start doing the PhD program. But that's very, you know, unique to my own kind of goals and ambitions. Um, for someone else, you know, that might be completely different, right? If someone just wants to write about it, that's that's different. If someone wants to paint about it, you know, that's that's completely different. Um, but you don't necessarily have to do a PhD in order to get or, or to write or to paint, right? Um, the PhD is an interesting and, and great experience for those who want to. But again, um, there's stats out there where like there's 50% of people who drop out um, that begin a program and then drop out. Um, so there's a lot of factors into it. But I, I think it's very much an individual. And I, I just kind of just gave you my perspective. So thank you for that question. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, that really gave me a little bit more insight as a person who does want to pursue like doctoral programs and um, very oftentimes like in several like more specific fields, um, there is that absence. Um, and uh, I think that's really, really cool work. I'm really looking forward to it, um, to seeing more. Um, and this is the last question that we've compiled. Um, and it's from Kim. And they ask, um, what is your background of? Um, so good question. What is my background? Um, my parents are from El Salvador. 
you know, immigrated in the 1980s. And I, I would consider myself Salvadoran American. Um, and that is, yeah, that's largely my background. I mean, I, I, I fit into the Latinx category, right? That's a bigger category. Um, and then there's a the category of being U.S. Central American, which some people also associate with. Um, I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit more, about, you know, these different terms, because I think these terms are really important. And I know I threw out some terms and might have not really kind of delved into them. Um, but there's also this kind of interesting term I didn't talk about uh, called Central American American, which is also kind of talking about identity, right? Being from Central America um, in the U.S. Is, is kind of like using this double kind of hyphenated identity that Maya Chinchilla uh, created in one of her poems. And is very generative in thinking about this in-betweenness. And I think all these terms that we might kind of associate, associate ourselves with um, are all interesting, especially at this point, right? When we're putting the X in La Latino or, or in Latinx. Um, these are times I think where we all kind of have to reckon with our own identity and how we see ourselves. But yes, for, for the time being, you know, I, I see myself as Salvadoran American. That's, um, thank you so much for um, sharing that as well. Um, I find it really interesting, like the Central American, American hyphenation. Um, it really puts into perspective about um, different groups of people from other than just what people typically consider as American. Um, right. Yeah, okay. So this is the last question that I, I received. Um, it's from Aaron and they ask, um, are you finding more scholarship on US Central American art coming out of the US or Central American countries? Great question. I would say largely United States. Um, there's been a lot of uptick or interest. And I think it's really from people that are kind of my peers in my generation, um, usually the sons and daughters or, or 1.5 generation of, um, that are, you know, really interested in this art world or, or you know, Latinx art. And in, in Central America, I can't really speak very much to Central America. I do know that some, a book came out um, specifically of El Salvador. And I found that really kind of interesting. I'm not so sure, so, so sure who wrote it, but it was just the art history of El Salvador from like 1900s, early 1900s. And I was really interested specifically of El Salvador. Um, and so reading that to me was generative, but I'm not so sure how much scholarship is actually being created. But in terms of the US, yes, I think there's a lot of kind of immersion or er earlier scholars, um, you know, even scholars like Ana Patricia Rodriguez has, has talked about artists, visual artists from the Washington DC area. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot of interest within the US. Uh, not so much outside, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised either. I, I just don't, haven't read, you know, come across uh, too much. But yes, within the US, I, you know, I'm happy to say that there's a lot more compared to 10 years ago. A, a lot of them are articles, maybe not full on books yet, but it's really interesting to just read, you know, and there's a lot to be written about, right? Uh, as we, like, as, as I said previously. So I'm really interested to see what other academics, um, you know, that are doing their PhD right now or that, you know, are, are, are younger or, or newer kind of uh, professors. You know, there's a lot of work being created. And I think, you know, I'm excited to read all that work. So cool. Um, after this event, I really want to go to the library and, um... Um, check out some more books and learn from uh, Ana Patricia Rodriguez um, and other scholars in this field. Um, I think that's one way to continue um, this conversation as well. Um, and then this is one question from Mercedes. Um, I think this might be the last one. Um, and they say, hi, I'm getting a sense that one of the main preoccupations for these works is identity. Um, from exploration and construction to create a new image. I'm assuming this is in reaction of negative images that are produced in the mainstream culture. Are there other strands or themes that are prevalent? And what is the place of this um, message? Um, this might be the wrong word in this context. Aesthetically, thematically, and on the identity level. Or will we say that we're creating something new? And I'll put it in the chat. So 
that's that's a good question. I think the theme of a lot of U.S. Central American artists might be about identity, and it you know exactly maybe that is the reason it's because it's a response to maybe negative or or you know not being able to identify with certain things um, in the U.S. or through mainstream media, right? So that's an interesting um, question to to really think about, right? Um, but I think Central American artists are also doing that. They're also creating artworks that's not necessarily about their identity per se. Um, and there's some artists that choose not to really bring in identity, right? I think, however, that in this exhibition, you know, the goal and the aim of the exhibition is clearly stated in saying that th this is what, you know, we, we kind of are looking towards a Central American identity or exploring that theme in this um, exhibition, which is, um, which is an argument, I guess, that's that's prevalent, right? Especially when if people of color, it's like, um, or artists, of people of color, artists of color um, create a lot of, you know, work that's about their identity. And, you know, there might be critiques around that. Um, but this exhibition, you know, specifically is looking towards that. Um, and I'm just reading the, the question. And I think there there probably are other themes, right? Um, I think this is just a very uh, a theme that you know hits a lot of Central American artists, and um, but it's all explored in their own kind of unique way. Even the the few pieces I showed, right? Um, there's probably a, there's a lot more story behind all of them, right? And I only just hit a couple of of pieces, but each piece, you know, hopefully while you, you know, if you listen to the other kind of explanations, have you know, much more deeper meanings. And I think that's that's what's interesting about art, right? Is that it's generative and it can kind of create uh, ideas or even theories, right? Um, and it's at the forefront of that production. And sometimes people pick up on it, you know, later um, to see like, I don't know, you know, there's always this idea of like the artist as a genius. And and this artwork is is being created right now. So it's at the cutting edge. And I think artwork, you know, like any expression, artistic expression is always at the cutting edge. So I hope, um, you know, maybe with time or, or now, people are gonna start noticing how kind of, you know, different themes or different ideas that are being presented through art. But yeah, at this current moment, I'm not so sure what other themes are, are prevalent, just that there is a lot of themes, right? And, and even in this one, um, yeah, but it's all at the individual level, right? Like I think each artist has their own purpose and, 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 and they create at a very, kind of have a lot of meaning behind their artworks. Thank you so much, uh, Mauricio. Um, that was wonderful. And we're going to stop the Q&A at this point. Um, and on the behalf of Seth Gallery, um, thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it over to um, Ana Patricia Rodriguez um, to wrap up this event. Thank you again. Okay. Well, thank you, Marjorie, for uh, fielding all those questions. Very interesting questions. Thank you to the public that was sending them. They were all, you know, uh, very uh, precise and very intuitive of, you know, this uh, exhibition that a lot of us haven't seen in person yet. So um, thank you very much for the questions. And um, I, you know, want to thank Mauricio for a very comprehensive um, presentation that um, actually connected different strands, right? And one of my questions at the end was going to be, you know, the, the exhibition is called Connected Diasporas. And, you know, one of, one of the things that in my mind, I'm always thinking about in a very comparative mode of the translocations with, you know, different um, communities in different places. Like what, what is it that connects us, right? What is it that connects Centroamericanos through, you know, visual arts, through literature, through, you know, representation? And, you know, that's, that's a big question and it's not to homogenize to, or to essentialize, right? You know, I, I agree with you, right? It's, it's not all about, you know, getting the, the representation of the identity, right? Uh, not at all, right? But what I find very fruitful is the, 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 different representations, that there isn't one consolidation of what Central American is, right? right. And all this artwork, you know, is, is highlighting different aspects. But if you can, and in closing, like maybe say a few words about, you know, you being on the West Coast, you know, uh, um, being our keynote for Connected Diasporas, are you seeing any trends that, you know, connect us, 
you know, the visual artists on the West Coast, on the East Coast, in the Midwest or whatnot, any trends that you're seeing across these different exhibitions and you're curating Caravana soon. So, you know, you've got all that artwork that um, you're gonna be exhibiting. One thing I do notice that it's, 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 it's difficult to kind of encapsulate all that, right? To see, you know, what is, but I think one time perspective is, is the nations um, in terms of traditions that were from the past. Um, we see, you know, sometimes the national bird, I think mm -hmm. of, of Central American countries, national flowers, traditional foods, those things that are that really come from, you know, Central America that are, you know, created there. I think those traditions I see kind of not often um, or not in every piece, right? But I do see it, it's like a theme, right? Or pointing to something that's Central American and that maybe only Central Americans might know of, right? Or if from your specific country, right? Like, um, you know, I think there was uh, the image of a Guarda Barranco and I thought, mm -hmm. you know, Guarda Barranco, but in, in El Salvador, it's it's uh, Torogos, right? So mm -hmm. there's there's kind of a uh, certain imagery that I believe is is there and sometimes it's 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 really subtle but i think that's one thing theme is that sort of connects us all is sometimes you know traditions or symbols icons that go back to central america even though you know because because they're they're especially if you were born in a central american household and, and raised you know these are icons that to other people it might not make sense but when you put them in a painting when you put them in visual art you know it makes sense for that person who might have grown up in the in a similar household right so mm -hmm. i think those are subtle right and, and i think each central american country has its own and and it's up to the viewer really to see that but those are subtle kind of iconic or, or symbols that i've i've seen um and that's a it's a good theme that i think connects us all right is is what is central america and you know what does it mean to be central american and what are these icons or images that are familiar to us. I think that's what kind of moves some of this artwork. Yeah, I, I, I love that's a, a good way to, um, to end, but not end, because, you know, you're leaving the question open ended, you know, what is it to be Central American, especially in diaspora, right, there is no one, um, no one meaning to this. And what's great about art and the signifying um, process and practice is that a sign never means one thing, right? It, right. It, it is made to mean, it'll mean different things in different contexts and by, you know, within different discourses. So it's an open-ended question, right? And we're not here to resolve it, but art helps us explore all the different manifestations and, you know, possible meanings, et cetera, right? So I think that um, this exhibition, your exhibition, Caravana, you know, are helping us, you know, kind of see just different aspects, right, of, of this construction of whatever Centro Americano and Centro Americana and Centro Medicanex are. And so I think a lot of us are very appreciative of that space that doesn't pin us as one thing, right? So thank right. you very much. I, th I thank the artists in this exhibition. Um, we thank Veronica Melendez, who has gathered all these uh, fabulous artists you, you know, uh, the art exhibit that you're going to be put, putting together, Caravana, with, you know, your colleagues. We also are very grateful for all this work that's going on. Um, grateful in the sense, too, that you're making visible um, the Central American in the United States. And we've had a whole history that has talked about the invisibilization, right? And yes. so, you know, you're on, you're on the forefront of making visible what has been invisibilized, right? So thank you for that. Um, along the lines of thanking people, I, I need to thank some of the people that um, or organizations or units that help us put uh, this exhibition together. Um, so first of all, thank you also to the audience that tuned in. Um, we got a lot of great questions and I know a lot of people from uh, hashtag Central American Twitter are out there because I was checking my Twitter. And so they're commenting, please, you know, comment more. Send us, you know, your reactions, your your takes and, you know, and and opinions. So that'll be great to see what, what happens on Central American Twitter and send TAM studies. Um, also, we'd like to thank um, the gallery, um, the stamp gallery for putting on this exhibition during COVID times. It's been, you know, quite a journey and quite an experience, very fluid situation changing day to day. Um, thank you to uh, Tara Youngborg for all the work that she's done and her staff. Thank you to Marjorie. 
um, who uh, fielded all these questions and um, was able to present, you know, also her um, her questions. And, um, and then also the staff that um, often, is, often is unseen, right? That is behind um, the Zoom window doing all this. So thank you to Chris, who's you know, back there and, and others. Um, again, uh, uh, Tara Youngberg has been just um, marvelous. So thank you, Tara. Um, we also wanna thank um, the exhibition co-sponsors, the School of Languages, Literatures, and cultures, my department, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at, at UMD. And we also wanted to thank uh, Casa de la Cultura El Salvador in Washington, DC, that's doing um, a lot of work uh, trying to represent Central Americans in the DMV, in the DC metro area. Um, we also wanna uh, invite you to, um, to attend, to, to visit us again. Um, we have a, a few other events coming up, an artist panel with, um, a few artists, Jesse DeSantis, Celia Guevara, Kimberly Levon, and uh, curator um, Veronica Melendez. We're gonna have an artist panel uh, that's gonna be on October 1st at the same, this time on a Thursday. On August, excuse me, October the 8th, at the same time, we're going to have a panel with Beatriz Cortez, Muriel Hasbun, and Chiara Machado, whom you, know, you, you talked about, um, the, the beautiful painting of the worry doll. Um, so we have that. Um, we're going to have a, um, a zine um, making um, workshop somewhere along the line. And at the end, we're going to have a closing dance party that we hope you will attend because we have to have fun too during COVID times. We have to, you know, stay alive, right? So um, having said all that, um, I again, thank you, Mauricio, for speaking to us. Um, we wish you so much luck and energy and stamina through the dissertation uh, writing process. Um, and I know that you know, you, you'll do fabulous work. We need your work. We need all the work of all the young scholars right now that are working very hard to you know, represent not only Central America, but you know, their own intellect and their own fields. Así que um, adelante, you know, let's go forward. We can't stop. So, um, Anyways, it's been a pleasure and, and I will be seeing you, I don't know, soon, maybe in the Bay Area, if I can get out there soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you okay. I, for these last words. I mean, everything you said was, was, was spot on. I mean, I, I really appreciate your, your also your input in saying some of these, you know, issues because again, yeah, what does it mean to be Central American? I mean, that's a huge question in itself. So thank you. Uh, and thank you for hosting this and thank you for inviting me once again. I hope everyone has a great, um, great experience in, in seeing these images and, and really, you know, hopefully they, they think differently about what it means to be a Central American, right? So thank you. Okay, thank you.